the Oracle Network. We have an active shooter. We have an active shooter inside the warehouse. Welcome to Active Shooter, a podcast that covers the whys, the hows, and the aftermath of active shooter and mass casualty events. They have an active shooter in the building. A second call says they uh, are being attacked. I've been shot. 16910 means we got shots fired. 415A at the Route 91. Sounded like an automatic firearm. Active shooter, reports of an active shooter, active shooter, active shooter of mass casualty incidents. Thank you for listening. You are listening to Active Shooter, a podcast that may contain adult themes, explicit language, and graphic depictions of violence. Portions of this show may be traumatic for those under 18. Listener discretion is advised. This is an NBC News special report. Here's Lester Holt. Good day, everyone. We're coming on to report what appears to be another school shooting. This one happening at Saugus High School in Santa Clarita, California, uh, just north of Los Angeles. These are pictures from KNBC that we all know too well of students being uh, evacuated from a school as authorities investigate what has happened and try to deal with the... Lester, this uh, happened about uh, half an hour ago, just before 8 o'clock local time in California. The shooting began... We're told inside the high school, as far as the number of gunshot victims, we don't know a confirmed number yet. It's been changing uh, by the moment. There are gunshot victims we have seen. Mass shootings are a part of our everyday life. Regardless of any person's stance on gun control and gun rights, the practical reality of American life in 2021 means you are accustomed to hearing about mass shootings. While this statement is wholly disturbing and unsettling, it is the world we live in. As various groups and advocates fight tirelessly to change laws and improve systems in the hope of eradicating these terrifying mass murder events completely, others are determined to ensure that the damage from these events can be minimized by providing active shooter training and other methods of counteracting the violence with methodical, well-designed safety plans. Though no safety plan is foolproof or 100% able to prevent all violence, some plans are detailed and practiced, enough to seriously reduce the harm and fatalities of mass shootings. Today's case demonstrates just how careful procedures and thorough training can make the difference in the outcome of such horror. However, make no mistake about it, we as a society must continue to work towards improving mental health systems in an effort to do away with mass murder and shooting events completely. They should never become acceptable, or merely something we learn to live with. While the Saugus High School shooting outcome was not as devastating as some other shootings, the effects that day had on each student, faculty member, or friend or family of anyone involved are lifelong, and they live with deep pain each day since. Traumatic events like mass shootings can cause severe trauma for all, not only the direct victims. Active Shooter, the podcast, is a High Five Holly production, and I'm your host, JT. If you've listened to our prior episodes, you know that the Active Shooter podcast team has taken the No Notoriety Pledge and we will not be sharing the real name of the shooters that we cover. We will be giving the shooters a pseudonym and refer to them by that name throughout the episode. This will help in clearing up any confusion in the story while remaining true to our pledge in not naming the shooter by their actual name. We will refer to today's shooter as Josh.
The shooting at Saugus High School on November 14, 2019, was planned. Yet, the shooter appears to have had no motive or reason for committing this devastating act. The day was Josh's 16th birthday, and perhaps to him, it was fitting to leave the world the same day he entered it. We will never know for sure. On November 14th, Josh made his way to Saugus High School, located at 21900 Centurion Way in Santa Clarita, California, arriving at his usual time. Classes started promptly at 6.50 a.m., but Josh skipped the first period, presumably working up the courage to carry out his plans. Perhaps waiting was his plan. Initially, Josh looked normal, at least on the surface. He wore his usual outfit consisting of blue jeans and a black shirt. Today, he also wore a black hat and carried a forty five caliber 1911 pistol with him. His intent? Kill as many innocent lives as he could. Josh was successful in a sense. He murdered two people and injured three others before turning the gun on himself. Upon arriving at school, several students were lounging outside in a grassy area commonly referred to as the Quad. Within the Quad is a wall, which is aptly named the Legacy Wall, for it lists the names of Saugus High School alumni and staff that have served in any of the branches of the United States military. The names on the wall include three graduates that died during Operation Iraqi Freedom. Hanging out near the Legacy Wall... Josh was observed by other students for about 40 minutes. He stood alone and was never even approached, let alone questioned about why he was there and not in class as he should be. After a time, Josh walked to another area of the quad where he stood in a, quote, trans-like state. He suddenly put on a pair of sunglasses, checked his watch, and then pulled the firearm from his backpack and started firing at random but with precision. Um, we were just sitting in English, and it's like 7.50 around there probably, and all of a sudden we just hear boom, boom, boom. Dozens of students were in the quad when Josh opened fire. Some were hanging out with friends, not having a first-hour class. Others were coming and going toward their classrooms. Bullets struck five different students. Five random students. No one was a target. Yet everyone was a target. I just saw him fire one, two, three. I just saw like a, just a body fall. And I, my first instinct was to get out of there and to find my sister. Surveillance footage would later show how purposefully and intently Josh pulled out his gun and shot fellow students. Some initially thought that balloons were popping, until they looked around and saw classmates falling. Um, I sat down like it was a normal day. I did my homework, and then I heard like a gunshot, but I thought it was a balloon because kids bring balloons like every day, even though we're not supposed to. And I thought someone like popped it or popped like a chip bag, and then I heard maybe like three more before everyone started running. The panic and shock filled the air, as it was immediately apparent that this was a very real shooting indeed. Josh's firearm jammed almost at once, but he was quickly able to clear the weapon. His familiarity with guns was evident to investigators during the review of the surveillance footage. He didn't move from his fixed location. He chased no one down, and simply shot the gun where he stood. The last bullet was used when Josh raised his pistol and shot himself in the head. He didn't die instantly. After being taken into the emergency room, Josh was placed on life support at the Henry Mayo Newhall Hospital and ultimately passed the following day at 3.32 p.m. with his mother by his side. The fact that the final shot was a self-inflicted wound to the head with the very last available bullet showed intricate planning on Josh's part. The entire event lasted a mere 16 seconds. 16 seconds. 
a few blinks of an eye. It was such a short amount of time for so much destruction. Hundreds, maybe thousands of lives changed forever, in sixteen seconds. Petrified students ran for their very lives during those sixteen seconds, which probably felt like hours. Three off-duty police officers, including an L.A. County Sheriff's Detective, an L.A. City Police Officer, and an Inglewood City Police Officer, happened to be at the school, dropping their children off for the day. What most likely started as a typical Thursday morning took a turn none of them ever could have expected. Yet there may be a reason they each were present and ready to spring into action that fateful morning. Within a minute of the start of the shooting, on-duty police were on scene, but the gunfire had already ceased by that time. Sixteen-year-old Gracie Muehlberger was the first victim who was declared deceased after arriving at the hospital. Police held a press conference, and while the sheriff was speaking, he learned that 14-year-old Dominic Blackwell had succumbed to his injuries. It's going to be a lengthy process, but we're going to be able to determine that. The investigators looked at the surveillance video from the school, not, okay. not cell phone video, it's an established okay. video system, and they watched it. What was the timeline on that number of minutes from the six? You know, I can't comment on that. This I do want to update one thing. We just received word that the, one of the 14-year-old victims at the hospital has also passed away. Just, just moments ago. So, um, our fatalities now are two. So, with heavy heart, we're gonna move forward with the investigation, figure out what went wrong. And uh, I hate to have Saugus be added to the names of Columbine, Parkland, Sandy Hook, but it's a reality that affects us all throughout the nation. Something we're gonna have to deal with. And as Captain Lewis said, we got to figure out. What are we doing wrong, and how can we stop this from happening in the future? So, we'll figure that out over time. Three of the shooting victims were injured, including a 14-year-old female student, who was shot in the lower right abdomen and left shoulder, a 15-year-old female student who was shot below the belly button with a bullet that traveled through her hip, and a 14-year-old male student whose injury specifics are unknown. The male student's injuries didn't seem quite as severe as the two female students because he was treated and released from the hospital the same day. All three students were listed in stable condition and survived their physical injuries. Students were evacuated from the school, arms raised above their heads as they silently exited the building of terrors. Surrounding schools were placed on lockdown and every student from Saga's high school was required to be interviewed before being released to their concerned parents. Police came, uh, opened the door. They, uh, one of them had a uh, gun raise. Our teacher, uh, uh, Jeremy Fenn, he uh, told us to have our hands up when he came in. There was a, a, f a few people crying, um, but it, overall it was very, very cool. Active shooter training and other safety measures were put into place at the school only a short time before this very event transpired. Some of these measures included gunshot wound kits. Addison, one of the female students who was shot, ran into the choir room, proclaiming that she was hit. The choir director immediately grabbed the gunshot wound kit, which allowed her to render emergency medical aid until paramedics arrived to whisk Addison away. The availability of medical equipment, no matter how crude, proved to be life-saving. I didn't really see it, but I saw him like fall, and then he started limping, and we went into the office, and he still like was holding his leg before we came into this room and locked it, and he was like in pain, and it was like stinging. I didn't know what it was. I thought it was a gunshot, but there was no bleeding, so... The school had no metal detectors, which did allow Josh to enter the campus with his weapon. However, there were numerous surveillance cameras and a fence that surrounded the school's perimeter and had a limited number of entrance points. Despite the lack of metal detectors, 
There is security in the form of an unarmed sheriff's deputy and nine campus supervisors who 